Okay, so I said we would do it, and we're finally going to do this. The Doom Patrol goes to space, amongst other places. So, to do this, we have to jump back to Volume 3, Issue 37. And I'm going to put this in the appropriate place in the playlist, which should be between the introduction of Danny the Street and the secret history of Flex Mentello, for anyone who's watching this out of order. So, yeah. If there isn't anything else to add, let's get started. Our story starts with the robot man trying to bring Dr. Colter up to speed with the events that happened on Danny the Street. Robot man has personally had his fill of the abnormal and requests that the next mission be against a bank robber or a normal criminal mastermind. Dr. Calder dismisses the idea and states that their work is far more important than anything the muscle-bound Cretans deal with on a case-to-case -case basis. That is when they notice a strange shift in the air. As they explore the farther rooms in the current wing that they're in, they are met with floating metal objects, a perplexed Joshua, and a reborn Rhea Jones, or as she would currently like to be addressed, Persephone. As she greets Cliff with a long time no see, Robot Man and Dr. Calder look up at her with amazement. As Rhea puts it, she feels better than she ever has before. The only difference is that now she feels the veins around the earth. She is attuned with the natural magnetic field in the earth and she can operate it like a switchboard. Dr. Calder is quite conscious of the situation. He wonders if this is the doing of the gene bomb. Perhaps it supercharged Ray's abilities while she was in a coma and it turned her into a chrysalis type state which in turn turned her into what she is now. This is all too uninteresting to Rhea. She can hear the sounds of calliope bells playing and children shouting. She rushes off to have some fun. She hears the circuses in town. As Rebus enters the room, it states how it feels distortions of time and space outside of the hideout and Robot Man questions the significance of the circus. Joshua explains that long ago, Rhea used to work for the circus. She was the circus strong girl, if he remembers correctly. People would travel for miles to see her lift these incredibly heavy metal objects. So in theory, if someone was to create a trap for our new Persephone, this would most likely be a route. A search party is quickly assembled and dispersed in order to bring Rhea back to the hideout. Elsewhere, on a strange ship, in space, Two creatures are discussing their upcoming plans. One wonders if they should move ahead and send down their probes to Earth. It also states that if the Geomancers arrive before them, it would be in their favor to send down the probe as soon as possible. The second being responds with saying that the Hus and his Ultra Quiz are no more familiar with the planet Earth than they are, so they shouldn't be at the point of panicking just yet. That's when the first snaps back, that if they fail, the cage will most certainly hand them over to the anti-mathematicians, and panic will be far too mild of a word to describe what they will be feeling. Over at the circus, Ray is greeted by the ringmaster. He recognizes her as Rena, the Amazon girl from years ago. He is delighted to see her and escorts her to the Hall of Mirrors. The Doom Patrol arrive on the scene and are greeted by a worker. He leaves the team confused and they notice that the entire circus is empty aside for the few people who actually work there. That is when they come up with a plan to split up and meet back at a specific spot in 10 minutes if they don't find Rhea. None of them manages to find Rhea but they do find distractions tailor-made for each of them. For Rebus, he finds the bountiful Babushka. Every nine months, Babushka gives birth to a tailor-made version of herself, miniature in size. Crazy Jane finds an old gypsy and has read some tarot cards that predict her immediate doom. And Robot Man finds the astounding Clockwork Man a 75-year robotic simulation of life. Unfortunately, none of our heroes are successful in finding their friend, 
Rhea is currently being tortured by images of her past self in the Hall of Mirrors, all asking her to join them, wherever they are. As Robot Man becomes enraged, he questions the Ringmaster on Rhea's current location. That is when the Ringmaster and the entirety of the circus disappear from under his feet. No more Ringmaster, no Dwarf, no Siamese Acrobat, no Merry-Go-Round, no Ferris Wheel, no Hall of Mirrors. Everything that was there, gone in a blink of an eye. As Robot Man looks around, he notices that Rebus is gone as well and Rhea is still nowhere to be found. Just him, Crazy Jane, and their two visitors from space. These visitors are the emissaries of the orthodoxy, and they are on a mission to locate and neutralize what they would call the pupa. Unfortunately, they are too late, and the Hussite geomancers from the Kaleidoscape preempted them. The pupa and the Ouroboros have been subtracted and taken to the Kaleidoscape. They fear that the pupa has been taken in some desperate attack on Judgment Rock, which would be bad news. Now, if you're like Cliff in all this, you're asking for one thing, an explanation. As the emissaries put it, they are a proud part of the orthodoxy of the insect Mersh, the one true church of the cage. Their enemies are the Ultraquist Geomancers, led by Apostate Huss. They are those who broke away from the Mersh and instigated conflict that has been spanning for thousands of years. The first of the wars were fought conventionally, using economic, spiritual, and temporal life as ideals to support the opposing forces. After so many soldiers were lost, it caused them to rethink their current methods of attack. That is when the Blink Wars started, where they would gather rooms full of telekinetic warriors that would broadcast energy of over a hundred lives filled with guilt and agony. This energy would take the form of a nuclear bomb and would detonate, leaving a massive psychic backlash of hauntings and more unexplained events. The next stage of wars were the Plague Wars, the Plague of the Tedious Dreams, the Silence Plague, and the Space Plague, amongst others. Unfortunately, these plagues did not destroy the Hussites either. This just resulted in the creation of the Kaleidoscape. Finally came the War of Nerves, the most recent war that resulted in the two warring factions ignoring each other into submission. And since that obviously isn't working, the emissaries feared that the Geomancers planned to use the Pupa, or Rhea's, electromagnetic bonding cycle to tamper with the Judge Rock. So, in order to save their friends, Cliff and Jane must travel with the emissaries to Mersh. But before that, let us travel to the Kaleidoscape. That is where we will find Rebus and a strange perplexing woman. This woman tells Rebus that the lodestone is safe, as well as introduces Rebus to the origins of the scape in which it resides. How her world was taken from her people during the Plague Wars. First, the words were taken from this world. Then, without words to describe objects or places, space was taken, leaving them with nothing but white emptiness, unable to move or speak. These people became pure mind and were able to create the kaleidoscape out of sheer thought in order to oppose the Mersh once more. She is a Hussite, a follower of Huss. Huss himself is a leader who will partner up with even the most unsightly of creatures to meet his needs. The glass swarms that will rip a body down to its bones in moments, or the blue fevers the ghosts that will haunt the ancient battlegrounds and rot away physical bodies of their hosts until only more fevers remain. And not to mention the smoke dogs, creatures who lack all senses but smell. These vicious dogs can smell right through time and space as well. Rhea, however, claims that she's not afraid of such dogs, and Huss is pleased by her response. 
He takes her and Rebus to the Judgment Rock with plans on destroying it and taking the artifact that lays within for himself. Yeah, so uh, that is part one of Doom Patrol Goes to Space. So the kind of goes to space, they kind of don't. It's kind of a little, a little complicated, but this is a lot of exposition, a lot of introducing the characters, things like that. Uh, I'm going to try to get the next three issues into one more video, so it'll be a little longer, but there'll be a little bit more action. Now that we got all the people on the board, we can actually, you know, do something with them. Uh, but yeah, if you guys like uh, these weirder story arcs for Doom Patrol, give this video a like, and uh, I'll try to make another one as soon as I can. And uh, stay tuned for Thursday, because we're doing Swamp Thing videos now, so that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, catch everybody later.